Okay, so to enrich our discussions, we have invited esteemed uh, discussants to give their insights. Allow me to introduce our first reactor, Mr. Nauto Kanahira. So Mr. Nauto joined the World Bank in 2010 and has held corporate roles on strategy, organization, budget and human resources and operational roles in Europe, Asia and Africa supporting technology, entrepreneurship, productivity, and promoting science, technology, and innovation partnerships and digital cooperation through UN, OECD, and G20 countries. Prior to the World Bank, he co-founded a mobile internet startup in the late 1990s in Japan, worked at McKinsey and Company, advising on digital transformation, and researched computer science and organizational behavior at MIT Media Laboratory. Mr. Nauto holds an MPA from Harvard University and, and a Master of Science degree from MIT. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mr. Nauto Kanihira. Mr. Nauto, you can start your presentation. Sorry. Uh, I should do my screen sharing my computer, is that correct? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, let me open my uh, presentation and do the screen sharing from here. Hope it works. And um, everyone see my presentation on screen? Very clear from our end. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Sony, and good morning to everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the ideas for organizing this mm -hmm. webinar on such an important topic on you know, universal broadband. I'd like to also thank the authors team, um, Monet, um, Dr. Chris and Queen for the informative publication and the excellent presentations. And also to my fellow discussant, Assistant Secretary Philip, for our continuous collaboration. Mm -hmm. Making broadband universal is among top priorities in the work of the World Bank in the Philippines. I'd like to contribute to today's discussion um, by adding some analysis from our recent policy note, which we published in January, and also um, Dr. Olbeta uh, kindly mentioned in his opening remarks today. So I'll start with the topic of digital divide. Um, Monet presented the poor access and high cost of internet. This result in inequity in access, and this is our urgent because uh, if unaddressed, digital divide can grow into broader development divides. The first graph I show here um, show broadband access by income quintiles. This comes from PSA's annual poverty indicator survey data. The expansion of access gap is alarming. The households with higher income quintiles significantly improved access to broadband while the poorer population helped. Access gap between the top two income quintiles and the bottom two income quintiles was 26% in 2019, and it expanded to 42% in 2022. The second graph here compares various goods and services with household penetration in the x-axis in the graph, and the changes in access gap over the three years between the rich and the poor in y-axis. It is very natural to see there's an upward trend, meaning as more people adapt goods and services, prices tend to go down, making them more affordable by lower income households. Governments play its role in ensuring equitable universal access to essential services, successfully done, for example, for electricity or safe drinking water. We see the landline telephone on the far left and the cell phones on the far right. And this we call disruption or leapfrogging. Broadband internet in, is on the bottom left, and this is an outlier. We don't see a pattern like this in any other public or private goods or services. 
With this um, trend continuing, there's a huge risk. Many services can go digital, but without narrowing the digital access gap, digitalization may not contribute to reducing poverty by any means. And an important characteristic of the internet inequity in this country is visible in these maps. These maps generated from OCLA speed test results show how low speed internet is spread on the top with the white lights and the high speed internet shown on the bottom maps uh, with the blue lights. There are fixed and broad, uh, mobile broadband shown differently. Um, so here in the Philippines, both low speed and high speed internet is fairly progressive actually. While for the majority of the household, even low speed fixed internet is not affordable. What this means is that private broad backbone networks typically reach most part of the country, but last mile networks struggle. An elaboration on cross-sector sharing of access networks by Dr. Chris points to exact challenge showing in this slide. There are always tensions involved between um, the competition and cooperation, the extent with which um, operators within and across utility sectors um, uh, compete or cooperate. I'd like to also highlight the weak competition within data transmission sector in the Philippines. Philippines is the most concentrated, most profitable, and least invested broadband market in the region. For the mobile, concentration is obvious. The Philippines is the only country with the top two operators with 90% market share as of 2022. And the Philippines is the only country with the top two operators earning profit above 50% as measured by earning before income taxes and depreciation and amortization, maybe not. On investment number of mobile towers per population is by far the lowest in ASEAN, except for Singapore where cell sites are built with buildings but not towers. The bottom chart shows investments in telecom infrastructure and resulting penetration of the internet over time. For the Philippines, um, from the national accounts, we can see telecom infrastructure investment or growth capital formation in telecommunications gradually declining from 0.64% of GDP in 2018 to 0.44% of GDP in 2022. From ITU data, we see around 100 low and middle income countries in the world invested at least 1% of GDP for at least one year over the last 15 years, and the Philippines haven't done it. So what needs to be done? Um, Dr. Monet presented a very useful framework of supply and demand factors and the different government roles as enabler, facilitator, and provider. The first thing to do, we believe, is to fix the supply side market failures by removing barriers to entry competition and investments, managing spectrum better, and also clarifying basic infrastructure sharing policy framework. It's the Connected on Pinoy Act, formerly known as Open Access in Data Transmission Act, to do this job. And we fully support this policy reform. For those of you interested, we did in-depth analysis in our recent publication. I will show the link at the end of my presentation. But more needs to be done through government support. The telecom industry through PISAC agrees on this point we make, not on other points we make. And they made ambitious recommendation to the president in April. We would say it's good if it's doable, um, but we need to see the 60 billion pesos annually to be allocated to DICT may <laughs> sound a blessing and or headache to our dear friend, Afik Philip. Um, we should discuss how we could make it doable. It will be useful to consider differentiated public private approaches towards universal connectivity. So this diagram is a fairly standard conceptual framework when designing interventions for connectivity infrastructure rollout. 
it uses real data from the Philippines with the X axis along the country's land mass by 1400 municipalities from high to low population density. And the Y axis with uh, cumulative population, cumulative broadband coverage or access, and with, with, with over which the fixed broadband. This comes from 2020 census. And at that point, fixed broadband reached 20% households. Broadband, including mobile internet, reached 56% of the household, with steep curves in urban centers, but flattering into less populated areas that you see. Uh, we divide notionally the Philippines into four regional segments. So first and second segments, urban and peri-urban areas, these areas host around 60% of the country's population. And these areas could be served by well-functioning and competitive markets. The third segment, the rural areas, hosts up to 90% of the cumulative population. Connectivity is largely limited to mobile in these areas or fixed wireless, but not fixed wired connectivity. Um, these areas should benefit more from both market reforms and complementary public investments to cr crowd in private investments and expand commercial sustainability frontier or affordable infrastructure deployments. In areas with latent demands for bandwidth um, from the broadband internet, public facilities such as schools, health centers, local government offices can be anchor tenancy for private operators. The fourth area, far flung areas, hosts the last 10% of the population. The government's missionary interventions may be necessary, but it needs to be done in economically viable, fiscally sustainable, and scalable manners, which is a challenge. And however, in combining private and public approaches to make internet universal, I must say the government still lacks sufficient policy options for fiscal space. If government invests more public resources in broadband access, the resource has to come from either someone paying more taxes or the government cutting expenditure elsewhere. In most other countries, such resources come from telecom operators generating what is called government spectrum revenue. In the Philippines, the total spectrum user fees, or SUS, almost tripled in five years, from 2.4 billion pesos in 2017 to 6.7 billion pesos in 2022. And of course, operators <laughs> complain about it. But in nominal terms, the, in, uh, the percentage of total government revenue, this has been almost nothing around 0.1% of the government revenue, which is around seven times lower than the average of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. And Spectrum is not the only fiscal channel from telco operators to the government. There are direct and indirect taxes as well. Two other main channels are contribution to what is called universal service funds and the corporate income taxes. Compared with the regional peers, the Philippines collects roughly half or less of the operator's revenue, provided that the Philippines doesn't have the universal service funds. And beyond payment from operators to the government, there is effectively no obligation to the top operators to expand rural coverage through their services. Typically, such obligations are attached to issuance of or renewal of operation, operator's licenses and assignment of the spectrum that. But in the Philippines, licenses have been given with legislative franchise and haven't been renewed and with any opportunity to attach coverage obligation. The only exception here is veto. I agree with all of the recommendations made by the PID's authors, including on cross-sectoral infrastructure sharing, leveraging satellite, revisiting design and implementation of various DICT and other department programs, and mapping and data collection mechanisms for facilitation and monitoring. The only one thing that I would add is to also think about revenue side, not just the expenditure side of the universal access policy mix. And it has to be done in ways compatible with the industry's long-term interests, 
which should be connecting all Filipinos and harnessing digital transformation opportunities for inclusive economic growth. So I would like to end my comments here by reiterating the World Bank's commitment to work with all of you on policy analysis, on reforms, and public and private investments to bridge the digital device and advance digital transformation in the Philippines. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate and looking forward to the discussions later.